Yes, but I needed that. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you for um, joining us. Thank you for for jumping on here, for tuning in. Um, I just want to uh, share a couple of things with you here. Um, I want to talk about the church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonian church. Um, they went through a lot of suffering and they were able to thrive, not just survive, but they were able to thrive. And actually, many people in their whole region came to know Jesus and heard the gospel because their attitude and their approach in suffering. And so we know that the word was written for our instruction, right? Written for our instruction, I should say. And um, what can we learn from the Thessalonian church? What can we learn from reading about them? So they're a great example for us. A little bit of historical background here. Thessalonica was the capital of the province of Macedonia. It was a, a Roman province in northern Greece. There was a Roman naval port there. So, you know, you get a lot of sailors coming in town. You know, it was a wealthy trade center because of the port. Uh, it was also a, a, a place where you had the, the Greek and Roman mystery religions of the day. There was a fertility cult there. So there was temple prostitution and a lot of immorality. Uh, and there were also zealous Jews um, that were persecuting the, the new church there. Um, so this is sort of the environment that they were in. You know, there, there's a lot of sailors in town. And, you, you know, it's it that kind of a, a port city, a lot of wealth, a lot of haves and have-nots. I'm sure there was some, you know, slave action going on there. And then all these mystery religions and, and this fertility cult. You know, it was a pretty rough place, I think, to be a Christian, right? And not only that, but there was this persecution from the zealous Jews there, right? And so on top of all that and out of this environment, the, the Bible tells us in Acts that Paul was there in Thessalonica and preached for three Sabbaths and then had to run out and move on to the next city. So... He, he basically was there for three weeks and planted a church and then said, I'll see you. Now, you have to remember, there's no Bible written yet, right? There's no internet. There's no books. There's no workbooks. There's no discipleship program. There are no training manuals. You know, it's like you guys are, are, are born again now. You're saved. You're filled with the Spirit. It's been three weeks. You're good. And I've got to move on now. So it, it's a... A, a pretty interesting thing what they had to get started with, you know, like how they just became a church and got started and, and what they had to work with, what their foundation was. The word tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, that they received the gospel in much affliction and joy. What a contrast. They received the gospel in much affliction and in joy, okay? But it does tell us that from these people from this fledgling church that, you know, got saved through affliction, the gospel spread through the whole region. So they were able to thrive and be successful. And so I want to look at what were the things that caused them to do this? What were the things that enabled them to do this? Why was the Thessalonian church able to thrive when they were so young and they had all these things coming against them? How did they do this? Well, the first key, the first thing that I see personally when we read through 1 Thessalonians is that they had their eyes on the prize. They were always thinking and remembering that Jesus was coming back. They lived with a daily mindfulness of the Lord's imminent return. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus said, if the master of the house knew what hour the thief was coming, he would have taken more care and locked the house, right? So it's this idea, if you know that something's coming, you're going to be more aware, you're going to be ready for it, right? And so these people were living with the daily reminder, the daily thought that the Lord's return was imminent. And so it, it affected how they went about their daily lives, right? Like if you knew there was a test tomorrow, you would study 
if you knew your boss was going to be examining you for promotion tomorrow, you would, you would get up and take a shower and put your best on. You'd be on point all day long, right? Well, it's the same thing. They, they were thinking constantly, Jesus is coming back soon. So, and he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? So living as if the Lord could be here any moment, and when he shows up, what will I be doing? He'll find me faithful. So this speaks to the power of vision. Vision is extremely important for us. The Lord knew this. The Lord said in, in Proverbs 29, 18, without vision, a lot of um, Bible translations say, without vision, people perish. And it's true. But when you look at this deeper, it, it's really saying without vision, people cast off restraint. So without vision, you live however you want to live, right? And so the Lord knew that it was important. And Paul knew when he wrote to them to keep reminding them and to keep them focused on the Lord's return because that vision of the Lord's imminent return was very important for how they live, right? How they go through the day. If we're going to endure suffering and even thrive in it, we have to have an eternal vision. We have to remember why we're doing this. We have to remember whose child we are and what the Lord is doing. So I want to insert right in here, 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter spoke about this as well. He was writing to all the churches about this. And he said, I, I, this speaks to us on this topic of vision and keeping the Lord's imminent return close to our heart close to our minds every day. So in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, he writes, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So Peter is writing them and saying, Listen, I want you to remember the prophecies that were written about Jesus in the Old Testament and our teaching, the apostles' teachings. For us, that would be in the New Testament. He's saying, I want you to remember the prophecies written, okay, about the Lord. And this is what he says in verse 3. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So this is a warning for us. It was a warning for the early church. The Spirit saw that this would be written into the canon of Scripture. These things were written for our instruction. And it's a warning to us today, okay? He's saying scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. This word for scoffers in the original Greek it does mean a mocker, but it also means a false teacher. False teachers will come in the last days teaching and living according to their own lusts or according to their own agenda, what they're trying to accomplish, right? And that teaching is going to be that the Lord is not coming back. You see that direct attack on the return of the Lord. There, these scoffers will come in the last days, these false teachers. They have their own agenda, and their teaching is going to be, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, it hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen. History just keeps going on. Everything's going to be fine. Now let's go to verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. He's talking about the great flood of Noah, right? But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In other words, Peter is saying, be mindful of this. Remember the prophecies in the Old Testament Remember the teaching of the apostles concerning the Lord. And he's reminding him here in verse 6. He will return, and this time the world will be destroyed by fire. Now, what good is it to keep these things in mind? Well, 
this informs the kind of people that we are. A, if we're living daily knowing that the Lord's return is imminent, we're going to be on our best behavior, basically, right? We're going to watch and pray. Uh, we're going to keep our lamps filled with oil, okay? B, if we keep this in mind, it is going to loosen our attachment to material success and the things of this world. If we keep in mind that these things that we're pining for, that we're striving for, that we're trying to accumulate, if we keep in mind that all of this is going to burn, it really doesn't matter that much anymore, right? It sort of diminishes its value in our eyes when we realize that this isn't going to last forever, okay? So let's go on. Uh, verse 8, he's saying, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some understand slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So in other words, he isn't, uh, Jesus isn't, we don't see his return yet, not because he's not coming back, but because he's being patient, because he's giving people a chance to repent. He's giving people a chance to come to know him. Okay, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and and the works that are in it will be burned up. Okay, remember, and Peter's writing to this church in, in uh, I'm sorry, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, keep this in mind. Remember the Lord's return. Peter is describing it for us here. Verse 11, since all these things will be dissolved, in other words, since these material things that vie for the affections of our heart, that we're pining for, these things will be dissolved what kind of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? In other words, keep an eternal mindset, keep your vision in eternity, always carry around with you the imminent return of the Lord because this will daily inform the kind of people that we ought to be. If you, if you didn't have a motivation, if you couldn't find a motivation to live in holiness and righteousness and the fear of the Lord, then let this do it for you, okay? That the Lord's return is imminent, that all of these things that we pine for uh, will be, be melted up you know, in, in judgment, and we can actually, in holiness and godliness, hasten the coming of the Lord. Isn't that something? What a wonderful thought. So to me, that's, that's really uh, what the, the Thessalonian church did. That was the first key. They kept the end in mind. Uh, here in, in uh, chapter 1, this back in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1 right here, in verse 9 and 10, Paul writes to them and says, You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. In verse 10 he says, And to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So in other words, that first key to thrive in suffering that we learn from this Thessalonian church is to keep an eternal perspective. That's the first key that we take away from them. Always carrying about within us that the return of the Lord is imminent. Turning away from our idols the way they turned away from theirs turning away from our idols to serve the living God and wait for the return of Jesus. It's so clear. If we do this, if we have vision for this, it will help us to be uh, thriving and successful. Okay, so the second key, there's three. The first one was to uh, keep the end in mind, like successful people. The first key was to always remember the return of the Lord. Okay, the second one is awesome too. This is the, what I call the three-legged stool of faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Most of us remember faith, hope, and love from 1 Corinthians 13, right? The, uh, uh, these three remain faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, right? 1 Corinthians 13. In 1 Thessalonians, 
right in the beginning of the letter that Paul wrote to them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Verse 2, he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. So he talks about their work of faith, their labor of love, and patience of hope. And later on, when he starts to finish the letter and conclude in chapter 5, he says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So these three things are really important in this second key. Faith, hope, and love. He talked about a work of faith. I believe this speaks to our attitude towards the past, right? Our attitude towards the past in that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the finished work of the cross, all of our atonement, our healing, our entrance into eternity, our restoration to the Father, all of that was finished on the cross of Jesus. That is the work of faith. Carrying that around, believing that. That's our attitude towards the past, right? That it was done. It was settled. It was completed, okay? There's nothing that we can add to it. We just freely receive this grace. We freely step into this finished work of Christ for us, okay? The next one was the labor of love. And I believe this speaks about our, our attitude towards the present, <laughs> Because sometimes love can be a labor, right? It can be hard to do. Love for God, which is demonstrated by living in holiness. Love for our brothers and sisters in the church, which is demonstrated by how we honor one another, how we lay down our lives for one another, how we respect one another, we serve and give to one another. And then love for the lost, which is demonstrated by our outreach and, and sharing the gospel. Right, And then lastly, of this three-legged stool was the patience of hope. And you probably guessed it already. This speaks of our attitude towards the future, the coming return of the Lord Jesus. So the first key was always carry that around. The Lord's coming back. He could be here tomorrow. He could be here at any minute. So let's not get too attached to the things of the world. Let's perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord so that we can be ready. Right. The second key was... This work of faith, trusting that it's finished. Our salvation is done. It's finished because of what Jesus, our great Lord, did for us. Amen? The labor of love, okay? Faith without works is dead. We can say, oh, I believe, I believe. You know what James said? He says, you tell me you believe by your words, but show me you believe by your actions. This labor of love are the actions of our faith. And then the patience of hope, right? This is only for a moment. This too shall pass. This is momentary light affliction. The Lord is going to return. So those are the first two keys. Looking for the Lord's return. Uh, the the uh, three-legged stool of, of faith, hope, and love. And lastly, the third key is living a godly life with simplicity of heart. It's very simple. You know, I was talking about this with some friends last week, and it's like, or earlier this week, I guess it was, but... You know, the word says that, you know, um, the Greeks seek wisdom and Jews look for a sign, you know, and the, the, the sign of the cross wasn't acceptable. The miracles weren't acceptable of Jesus and that the wisdom of, of the gospel was just foolishness to the Greeks. They couldn't accept it. And I think a lot of times that, you know, that's a metaphor. That verse is a metaphor for basically two kinds of people, there are people that just want to comprehend what's going on with our minds. And there are people that have to be impressed with some kind of sign in order to believe. And I think a lot of times, you know, the word was written for our instruction, as I said before. A lot of times it's so simple that we struggle with it. We want to make this more philosophical. We want to make this more mystical. We want to make this more difficult. But it's really simple. And then if we, if, you know, we hit that Greek aspect and then others of us for the sign, it's like, we want like this great quest. We want, you know, fast and pray for 40 days and I'll teach you how to raise the dead. It's like, we're, we're constantly chasing gold dust or something. 
you know, all those things are fine. I don't have any problem with those. But the problem is when we, we pursue those things and we don't live according to the basic principles of the, of the word, right? This is interesting. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the same letter that Paul wrote to them, this is the third key, living a godly life with simplicity of heart. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, he starts off by saying, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. We don't need a whole bunch of prophetic roundtables to help us figure out what the will of God is for us. It's great to have insight. I'm a very prophetic dude. I have dreams. I get visions. I'm not knocking prophetic ministry or the prophetic gift. But I'm saying sometimes we overcomplicate something like just knowing God's will for our lives. He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, right? Some of these things are just written out plainly for us, and yet we really struggle with them for some reason. This is the will of God, your sanctification. In other words, the will of God for every believer is not to go into full-time ministry, not to get promoted, not to be wealthy. Maybe all of those things are in God's plan. Maybe. But they're not our first pursuit. The will of God for every disciple is holiness, is our sanctification. And I know this isn't exciting. I know this isn't like, you know, something that's like, wow, you know, okay, I can give my life to that. Listen, you know, our lives are not our, our own anymore. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the will of God for me is to be sanctified, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's his will. And it's right there. It's plain. So this is the third key. Understanding the simple will of God for every believer and pursuing it. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 again. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he goes on and gives them some guidelines, some rules for living. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. Remember, there was a fertility cult in this town. There were temple prostitutes in this town. And he's saying, you need to abstain from that. Verse 4, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel or body or temple in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. In other words, self-control is also God's will for our life. Verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. So again, God's will for our life, no manipulation of each other, no lying, no control, no using one another for personal gain. Verse 7, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And Paul goes on and says to him, you skip a couple of verses, go down to verse 11 and 12. You should aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Boy, a lot of times in our day, we're really into the decree and the declare. You know, we take authority over stuff and we do all this and, and we're like, you know, why am I still lacking things? Man, the, it, if we're not living according to the blueprint, you know, maybe that should give us a clue. Aspire to lead a quiet life that goes so counter to the culture that we live in today. You know, it's a, a culture of self-promotion. You know, it, it's a culture of, of, uh, of trying to, of ambition and, and trying to rise to the top. You know, the Lord reminded me today, the sin of Babylon was this. Come, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's elevate ourselves up to heaven, right? And that really speaks of our culture today. Here Paul is saying, you should aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. So then in verse 5, he goes on, or, I'm sorry, chapter 5, he goes on and says some more rules for living. We're, we're pretty familiar with a lot of these, I'm sure. We urge you, brothers, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14. Now we exhort you, brothers, 
Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Again, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Very simple, very clear, telling us plainly what the will of God is for us. To rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. In verse 19, he says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Amen. So really what we're seeing here in the Thessalonian church, very similar situation to what we're facing today. They received the word in much affliction, but they did it with rejoicing. This was a fledgling church. Paul was there for three weeks by all accounts. It says he was there for over three Sabbaths he ministered there. Okay, So he was only there for three weeks. It's a city of great wealth, great immorality, uh, and persecution, right? And they thrived because they still, the whole region heard about Jesus. It says the whole region was filled with the gospel from the church in Thessalonica. And they did this with those three keys, right? Those three things were able to carry them through this. The first one, you remember, it was always remembering the imminent return of the Lord, living in full view that Jesus was going to come back, that the earth and, and the material things and the elements, all of this was going to be burned in the fire. And so we're not going to pine for these things of the world because it's all going to burn, right? And we're going to be living in holiness to the best of our ability as we're led by the Spirit because the Lord could show up at any moment, okay? And then the second key was that three-legged stool of faith, hope, and love. Faith in what Jesus did in the past, love for what we have to work out in the future, and hope for the payoff, the joy set before us so that we can endure suffering like Jesus endured the cross. And the third one was just simple, quiet rules for living. Just leading a simple and holy life. And I challenge you to take some time over the next couple of days and read through um, First and Second Thessalonians and just go over and over and again. Just, just think about these simple rules. Meditate on these things, these guidelines. You know, the, these things that he said of rejoicing always and praying without ceasing and caring, upholding the weak, caring for each other and nurturing each other. So I hope that encourages you tonight. I just want to do some worship, get in the spirit. And then I'm so grateful that the Lord has given us the word, that these things were written for our instruction. Okay, We don't have to stress and wonder what the will of the Lord is for us. Twice we just read, he said, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification. And then he said, you know, rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, being thankful in all things. This is the will of the Lord for you. Amen. So let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you that even in this time of struggle and even in this time of uncertainty, thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you give us instruction for living Thank you that your word is alive and that it's life. Thank you, Jesus, that you remind us that for us, your people, we live by every word that comes from your mouth. We thank you for these words inspired by the Spirit, written into the 66 books of the Bible. Lord, we just submit to your word now. And we ask, Jesus, that the Spirit would wield this sword and separate the spirit and soul from us. Lord, separate the carnality and the flesh and the soulishness from us, Lord. We just ask, Lord Jesus, that this word would do a great work in us. Help us to always remember, Lord, that we're your children, that you're coming again for us. Lord, don't let us be too gripped by the things of this world. But Lord, help us to hold all things loosely, knowing that your return is soon. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be confident in you, Lord, that our faith would be in what you've done for us and the finished work that you did on the cross. 
and your resurrection from the dead. Lord, that this would drive us to works of love for our families, for our neighbors, for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we would always carry this around, Lord, this hope of your return, this hope of the goal at the end. And Lord, convict us. Lead us by your Spirit every day to live according to your word, to be people of your word. Thank you, Jesus. I just plead the blood of Jesus over all these people, Lord, that no plague would come near their dwelling. Lord, I thank you for safety. We shelter in you. Lord, heal marriages, heal bodies. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for joining me. I hope you uh, got something out of this. And if you have any questions or any feedback, then uh, give me a shout. Shoot me a message. All right. See you guys. Love y'all.